Hello, movie fans. If you like indie the town and indie the genre, then it's your lucky day. It's our Heartland Film Festival special, and we're about to bring you the latest scoop on this year's crop of truly moving pictures. We've got Elson Edmonds with Heartland Headlines, reviews from Nick Ewing, Nicole Kane, Brandon Krakowski, and much more. The lights are on and the cameras are rolling, so grab some popcorn and take a seat, because the real deal starts now. Hello and welcome to The Real Deal, Ball State's one and only entertainment news show. I'm Connor Fack. And I'm Ramel Tadai. With the annual, annual Heartland Film Festival really getting in gear this week in Indianapolis, our crew has been diligently working and reviewing all kinds of films from the upcoming festival. But there's always more to cover. Here to give you the scoop about the festivities is Allison Edmonds with Heartland Headlines. Allison? Thanks guys, it's official, the Heartland Film Festival is finally here and there are so many exciting events that are taking place in Indianapolis for the next 10 days. This particular festival has been held in October in Indianapolis, Indiana since 1992. The festival gives moviegoers access to more than 100 visiting independent filmmakers from all over the world right here in the Midwest. Now the Heartland also happens to be a qualifying festival for the annual Academy Awards within the short films category. This year, the festival has 76 submitting countries, 134 films programmed, and 27 U.S. and or world premiere titles. This festival is definitely going to be a great one. Now, the festival kicked off October 4th with a pre-party in Keystone and a screening of Robert Downey Jr.'s latest film, The Judge, at the Indianapolis AMC Castleton Square 14 Movie Theater, where Downey and director David Dobkin made a special appearance for Q&A. The upcoming events are as follows. October 16th is the opening night screening of Jason Rittman's Men, Women, and Children, followed by an after party. The event is going to be held at the Indianapolis Museum of Art at 7 o'clock p.m. and is open to viewers of all ages. Now, there will also be a, sp a special presentation of Bill Murray's latest film, St. Vincent, on October 19th and the Benedict Cumberwatch World War II drama, The Imitation Game, on October 22nd. The next big event is the awards ceremony, which will be held on Saturday, October the 18th at Old National Center in the Egyptian Room at 8 p.m. And to wrap up the festival, the closing night screening of the French film Belle and Sebastian, followed by an after party, will be on Saturday, October the 25th at the Indianapolis Museum of Art at 7 p.m. Now, I know that was a lot, but on top of all of these exciting special events and screenings of hundreds of independent films, there is also a high school competition for this festival. Now, sponsored by the Bourne Foundation, the high school film competition selected Zachary Oshchin, director of Chris, as its grand prize winner. The winner and guardian will receive an all-expense-paid trips to Indianapolis and two all-access passes for the festival. Now, there were also four finalists selected, and each finalist will receive two all-access passes for the festival as well. Now, I hope everyone plans on keeping up with the, film, with the events of the film festival, or maybe even plans to attend. Now, you can get your tickets to the individual screenings and special presentations at www.heartlandfilm.org, you know, if they haven't already sold out, of course. Well, that's all from me here. I'm going to send it back to Ramel and Connor. Thanks, Allison. There's sure a lot going on at Heartland this year, and those are just a small portion of what we'll be playing. But it just goes to show how many great films are at this year's festival. One of them, like Allison said, was the film The Judge by director David Dobkin. We mentioned last week how our producer, Eli Ralston, attended that question and answer session and was able to grab an exclusive interview with both Dobkin and Robert Downey Jr. In case you missed it then, here's a peek of what went down. And I understand um, you and your wife just started a production company that actually produced this film, if I'm correct. Uh, is this the first film that you've produced? And if so, what was that process kind of like of starting a production company and starting producing films? Um, well, really, it was just David and my wife Susan and myself and the other producer, David Gambino, just sitting around a table in Venice talking about ideas. And as all these other bigger projects that we've been used to kind of have release dates or there are these big kind of grinding behemoths of industry, this felt like something that just started from a conversation about family, about, about the Midwest, which is where Susan, my missus is from and about what is it about that that helps people be able to go out and have the sort of achievement that can seem so honorable and what's it like to go back to that small town and 
What's what are the things that you're like, man? I can't wait to get away from here and do this. And then what do you learn when you come home and really reconnect with the, the people who who raised you, for better or worse? And how do you make peace with uh, with your home? No, it's always insightful to speak with celebrities up close. You can find the full interview at realdealbsu.com. Here on the show, though, we're just getting started, moving on to look into a variety of movies. Sadly, lots of them shown at the festival won't be receiving nationwide releases, and for many, Heartland will be the only chance to catch them in theaters, at least in the U.S. Our crew, however, got an advanced look at several of the selections, and they're here to tell you what you need to know. So, to start us off with a Nepalese feature film titled Highway to Dampas, we have our one and only Nick Ewing. What do you have for us, Nick? Highway to Dompas is the first feature-length film from writer-director Rick McFarland. It's a touching story about a group of people without much in common who all discover their own reasons to change for the better. Rachel Hurd Wood plays Elizabeth, a spoiled London celebrity who's had a few mishaps with the media and tarnished her public image. Her father hires a seasoned photojournalist, Colt, played by Gunnar Wright, to be her chaperone in Nepal where she plans to do some philanthropic work for an orphanage in an attempt to make herself look better. When they get to Nepal, they are met by Ajit, a savvy bush pilot tasked with transporting them through the city and flying them to and from the orphanage. At the orphanage, they meet Lax Me, the young headmistress who also grew up there. Over the following days, this unlikely group of people from completely different worlds bond and form relationships, as well as learn more about themselves than they probably expected to. The story itself isn't anything new or amazing, but the characters are unique enough to keep you interested for the duration of the film. It definitely helps that the movie was shot entirely in Nepal. The foreign landscape and setting are visually stunning, and definitely add a lot of character to the film. The cinematography itself is also very good. I love the few scenes in the film where we see the tiny plane flying over the beautiful mountains and forests that make up the Nepal countryside. I was impressed by mostly everyone in the cast. They all gave strong performances that were both convincing and believable. Raj Balav Kerala did an especially good job in bringing the character of Ajit to life. Rachel Hurd Wood also did a good job of making me believe that her character was truly changed for the better by working directly with the children in the orphanage. Technically, I thought, I thought the film had very few flaws. Everything from the cinematography to the editing to the choice of music was very fitting and helped to make me feel like I was there experiencing Nepal with the characters in the film. I was surprised when I realized the film is from a first-time director, but I'd say that's a good thing for writer director Rick McFarlane, and I look forward to seeing what else he has in store for us down the road. Thanks, Nick. Sounds like that film is on the highway to Award City, population one. I... No, Connor, no, just... No. No? Oh, come on. Well, while Ramel rethinks the life choices that brought her to be here at this moment, it's time for us to take our first break. When we come back, Nicole Kane will review a new Orleans set fable of Music in the Mind, and Brandon Kratkowski will tell us about a Japanese film modeled on a Charlie Chaplin classic. But first, here's this week's box office report. You and I are finally done. No, we're not done. Who are you? Is that a pirate's box? Uh, yes, it is. That is so dope. I still have me arms! Awesome. Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Life because of what I did to save you! The Murderer. 
Welcome back. Glad you stuck around, like Ramel here. I've realized I'm stuck with you. I suppose it could be worse. Oh, certainly. However, you are also stuck with introducing our next great review. Right. Well, regardless, here's Nicole Kane and her review of Una Vida. Nicole? Una Vida, a fable of music and the mind, is a wonderful film that I was lucky enough to review from this year's Heartland Film Festival. Directed by Richie Adams, the film stars Joaquin de Almeida as Dr. Alvaro Cruz, a neurologist who is dealing with the passing of his mother from Alzheimer's. Set in New Orleans, Louisiana, where Dr. Cruz grew up, the film's plot picks up when he notices an elderly jazz singer outside a cafe. The jazz singer is Una Vida, played by Anjanwe Ellis. Dr. Cruz soon discovers that she is suffering from the same disease as his mother. But whenever she is singing or hears music from the past, the fogginess and confusion that comes with the disease of Alzheimer's lifts, and she's able to remember. Throughout the film, we see Una Vida's condition decline, and Dr. Cruz offers her friend her friends to help care for Una Vida. By doing this, he discovers that she had a son that was taken away by the state when he was a young boy. The, the big question is, can Dr. Cruz find Una Vida's son and reunite the pair? Well, you are just going to have to see the movie to find out. This film really touched me because it's a powerful message. It brings new light to Alzheimer's and shows that a loved one is still there despite the disease they are suffering from. It also brings an interesting point to research that is being done in that some Alzheimer's patients become responsive when and after hearing music from their past. The film really makes the viewer care for the characters by placing them in situations we see every day and by giving the image that what if these people were your family. In my opinion, this film is incredibly inspirational and uplifting and it draws attention to something that many of us don't really think about every day but really should. I highly recommend it if you have a chance to attend the Heartland Film Festival this year to take the time to see Una Vida. This has been Nicole Kane. Back to you guys. Thanks, Nicole. Music certainly is a powerful healing tool. I know I always perk up when performing. I've always been a fan of the stage, the audience, the stage lights. Really? Hmm, never noticed. Oh, sure. I was born to live in the limelight. Okay, easy, Tiger. So, well, speaking of the limelight, here's Brandon Krakowski and his review of the festival award winner from Japan called Uzumasa Limelight. Brandon? From director Ch Ken Ochiai comes the new film Uzumasa Limelight, which stars Fukumoto Saiso as Kamiyama, an aging actor who is employed as an extra at a Japanese film studio in Uzumasa, the Hollywood of Japan. He most often plays warriors slain by the hero in a long-running samurai TV show. When the series is abruptly canceled by a young hotshot producer, Kamiyama and his fellow extras find it hard to find work in an industry that favors fresh young faces and are forced to take jobs in an in-studio amusement park. Yamamoto Chihiro plays a young actress who met and quickly befriends Kamiyama, later becoming a very successful lead actress on a new samurai show aimed at a younger audience. The film uses Charlie Chaplin's Limelight as its inspiration. In Limelight, Chaplin plays an aging clown who is out of work and is only able to perform street shows. All the while, he helps a young, depressed dancer navigate her way through show business as she slowly becomes a star. Though Chaplin's influence is extremely evident, for the most part, Uzumasa transcends the potential to be seen as a copycat and works as a remarkably poignant look at the Japanese film industry in its own right. First, all of the performances in this film are excellent. Saiso does a remarkable job as Kameyama. His physicality and facial expressions alone make his performance one of the most memorable of the year so far. He also did a remarkable job with the swordplay and pretending to die. Now one would believe that he had been doing this kind of work his whole life. Also turning in a fine performance is Chihiro, whose wide-eyed innocence and self-doubt create a remarkably relatable character that the audience can't help but feel for. There was not a weak leak in the cast. Everyone from the head of the studio to the lowly extras all gave their all and created a completely believable world. Uzumasa Limelight was also excellent on a technical level. The actors' performances were extremely well captured, the fight scenes were very well choreographed, and the whole film was beautifully edited. However, there were a few issues with the film. While the film does use Limelight as a template for how it's telling its story, there are times where it feels like they use the film as less of an inspiration and more of an example to ape Chaplin's storytelling style. In addition, there were a few subplots, primarily those involving 
a former lead actress and the dead wife of Kamiyama that don't seem to go anywhere and seem to just be means of extending the film's runtime. But all in all, Uzumasa Limelight is an achingly beautiful, exceptionally acted and directed piece that casts a light on a group of people that, whose stories we might not always know, we should always keep in mind. That's it for my review of Uzumasa Spotlight. I'm Brandon Kretkowski. Thanks, Brandon, for shining a light, a limelight, if you will, on that film. The festival really is an excellent opportunity for many well-made foreign films to get the recognition they deserve. Again, many of these films are films you won't find anywhere else, locally, anyway. And you at home certainly deserve more exclusive content you won't find anywhere else. Coming up after our next break, when we come back, Aiden Hall will interview Ball State graduate student Christopher Kaczynski about his documentary on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Don't touch that dial. Glad you stuck around. Heartland is not only a showcase for many internationally made films, but it also features pictures from right here in Indiana. This year's Indiana Spotlight series features projects from three Hoosier filmmakers. And our very own Aiden Hall got to sit down with one of these filmmakers, Ball State graduate student Christopher Kaczynski, the executive producer and director of the documentary The Healing Wall. So without further ado, here's Aiden Hall. Thanks, guys. Tonight I'm joined by Chris Kaczynski, the creator of The Healing Wall. Hi, Chris. Thank you for coming on tonight. Thank you. Uh, just for our viewers that don't know, what is The Healing Wall about? The Healing Wall is a, a documentary film. It's an hour long. It's about the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., and how its unconventional aspects of landscape architecture actually led to some sort of a healing process of the Vietnam conflict. And it's a very hard-hitting film. Uh, what made you decide to do this film? Uh, well, we uh, here at Ball State University, we had, we had this project where we were doing a, uh, an application for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund and the National Park Services. Those were our community partners. So we wanted to do uh, some videos for that application. And when we started interviewing people, I started getting, I, I read uh, one of Jan Scruggs' books, uh, The Founder of the Memorial. I thought to myself, there, there's a deep narrative here. There's a story that needs to be told, a story that hasn't truly been told, you know, completely, I thought. Um, and that was, uh, that was about how the controversy of this, this memorial, you know, led to this healing process and, and uh, the, the unconventional aspects. So I, th I think a lot of people really get a lot from, from watching the film. And then how did you become a part of the uh, Heartland Film Festival? Well, I submitted to the Heartland Film Festival. It's something that uh, I've always heard about the Heartland Film Festival. Mm -hmm. It's Heartland Truly Moving Film Festival. That's a, you know, I've, I've always remembered it as. And uh, the films that are put there are, are films that are supposed to inspire people. And uh, this year I, I, I said, you know what, if there's, if there's one film, this is my first film I'm submitting, I hope I'm making it into Heartland. And it was the one film festival that I really wanted to be in. And the uh, funny thing is, is the, the, um, the slogan for this year is change your perspective or shift your perspective. And uh, that's, if you, if you could ask me about what the healing wall is about, it's about shifting your perspective. So uh, I couldn't have been able to be in, in a more perfect year. I mean, it's just amazing. So what do you want the perspective of the viewer to be shifted towards? Like, other than the Heartland Film Festival, what is the purpose of this film? Well, I think a lot of people um, with the Vietnam Veterans uh, Memorial, you know, uh, people, it, it's so much different than the, your average memorial. And, I, and if you go there, you, you can realize it. But if you haven't, I want people to be encouraged to go to Washington, D.C. and check this out. You go to the uh, World War II Memorial and it's, you know, America, you know, and all this stuff, which it, it's, it's a great memorial. But when you go to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, you see that, you know, the black granite, you see all those names along that wall. And, and it really puts uh, a true depiction in, uh, of, of the cost of war. And, and I think that's what hits people hard. What would you say is the, f the thing you had the most enjoyment out of in making this documentary? What was your favorite part of it, I guess, is the question. I think my favorite part about making this documentary is uh, uncovering like how crazy it was for them to make this memorial. There were so many obstacles and two opposing sides, you know, um, that two strong opposing sides. One that wanted to have this memorial built so bad and another one that wanted a more conventional memorial. 
And uh, the, the struggles that they had make, building this memorial, is, it's, it, it's a very, very interesting story. But the one thing that I would say that I took the most out of um, was throughout this whole entire process, I've gained such a deep appreciation for our veterans and military personnel. I mean, honestly, the truth is, is I wouldn't have the freedom to make a film like this if it wasn't for them. Um, and and the, I have such a deep gratitude to them, and, and I, I just really, uh, I'd like to thank them personally. Well, just on a lighter note, what is some, what are some of the films that you're excited about seeing at the Harlan Film Festival where your film is premiering? Yes, um, I'm really excited to see uh, uh, my friend James McKenzie's short film, uh, Audrey Makes a Mixtape. I'm also really excited to see some of the other shorts at the festival. But uh, overall, this is going to be my first uh, festival experience as a director. And I can't wait to just ex you know, go, go to different films and, and see them and just really embrace the culture of, of a film festival that you're a part of. Um, it's something that I'm just so excited for. All right. Well, thank you very much. And check out The Healing Wall when it comes to the Heartland Film Festival. Uh, I'm Aiden Hall. I'm Christopher Kaczynski. And back to you guys. Thanks, Aiden. Not only does the Healing Wall have a great Ball State connection, but it also has a Real Deal connection. One of our executive producers, Julia Ritchie, served as a researcher on the film, and we'd like to congratulate her for making it so far with such an impressive project. And since you've made it so far into the program, you won't want to go away just yet. When we come back, Connor and I will give you our final word on a few of Heartland's other offerings. Stick around. You aren't just someone I loved back then. You are the very best of me. Hey, girl. Oh. Get that a lot. The Book of Life. We never run before. Why are we gonna run now? We're still in this fight. We're still in this fight. Now. Thanks for staying with us. Now, again, the films we've taken a look at so far have just been a small piece of the total that Heartland has to offer. And while we've mostly mentioned narrative films, documentaries and short films make up quite a large part of that lineup as well. So, here's a look at some outstanding examples in those categories. This is The Final Word. A documentary film I would like to see is Holbrook Twain, an American Odyssey by director Scott Teams. The piece is an introspective look at actor Hal Holbrook and the iconic theater show he's performed for six decades. Now, Holbrook is an impressive actor any way you look at it, having appeared in dozens of film, stage, and TV roles since the beginning of his career. An impressive recent credit was the prominent Republican leader Francis Preston Blair in Spielberg's Lincoln. Since 1954, however, Holbrook has been best known for appearing in a one-man show of his own devising, Mark Twain Tonight, a dramatic recitation of many of Twain's more comical writings and lectures, with himself made up into Twain's spitting image. To put such a long tenure into perspective, Holbrook has been appearing as the great American author and humorist for only 14 years less than the 74 that Mark Twain was actually alive. Wow, now that's impressive. It certainly is. <laughs> The documentary chronicles the history of this monumental feat with film shot over a three and a half year period. With a heavy focus on how the now 89 year old Holbrook initially assembled his material in the late 40s and early 50s, an American Odyssey also spends much time with the actor in the present day, offering a rare backstage glimpse into his rituals and acting process. Present too are some big names like Martin Sheen, Sean Penn, Cherry Jones, and others who are just some of the millions of theater goers that have seen and felt the tremendous impact of Mark Twain tonight over the years. The film looks stunning in its black and white cinematography too, a decision explained by director Scott Teams as an attempt to capture both the timeless and contemporary feeling of Holbrook's stage show. One of the reasons that the show has lasted so long is that most of the topics Holbrook quotes Twain on remain relevant up until the present day. With dry wit and sharp poignancy, he speaks about the nature of humanity, love amongst peoples, and both the horrible cruelty and tremendous charity that we can all show one another. 
as an actor, historian, an American, and just a person in general. Holbrook Twain, an American Odyssey, looks like a documentary I should definitely get my hands on soon. And as for me, the film I'm looking forward to seeing is the short yearbook directed by Bernardo Brito. This narrative short follows the story of a man living his plain life until one day he is hired by a secretive company to compile the history of man's existence before the world comes to an end. Following the characteristics of director Bernardo Brito's style, this intelligent tale favors a story over technique. Born in Brazil and raised in the United States, Brito captured the essence of his middle school obsolete Microsoft Paint animations into the film, thanks to his education at New York University's Tisch in 2007 for film production. Throughout the short, the main character spends the remaining 17 years of his life sitting in front of a computer at a mysterious company and deciding how to condense all of recorded civilization before being obliterated by an alien's missile. In an interview with Filmmaker Magazine, Brito explained his reasoning in creating this short after dealing with little success from his previous work. It didn't mean anything, and people would just forget about it, explained Brito. How do you deal with making things that people won't remember 100, 200, 300 years from now? Though it looks as though Brito backtracked to his MS Paint roots, and the film takes an alternate route in animation and, telling, and storytelling that is not only intriguing, but with a compelling storyline to boot. As a big fan of animated feature films, your book definitely falls into the animated drama category amongst the likes of Richard Linklater's Waking Life and Satoshi Kon's Paprika. It really digs deep into the existential thinking of what we as a human race have accomplished and what we will be remembered by. Well, and that wraps up our special show tonight, but our Heartland coverage doesn't stop here. We'll be posting reviews, interviews, podcasts, and more on our website, realdealbsu.com, throughout the run of the festival. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for updates on our Heartland coverage and all things entertainment. I'm Ramel Tadai. And I'm Connor Fack. We'll see you next time.